Dante reserved the fourth circle of hell in his inferno for the hoarders and wasters in life. Hello, my name is Jim. Welcome to my channel about books and reading and stuff, 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 and stuff. I've just read a book called Stuff. This is by Randy O'Frost and Gail Steketty. This wasn't so much about stuff, but more about hoarding syndrome, about the people who hoard stuff. They say in the beginning, for a surprising number of people, the attachments they form to the things in their lives interfere with their ability to live. And like a book by Oliver Sacks, this goes through a lot of case histories of different hoarders. When Randy O. Frost started looking into the term, which he calls hoarding syndrome, he was surprised by the number of hoarders he found. The book starts with the famous Collier brothers who lived in New York and died in 1947 in a flat surrounded by 140 tons of stuff, papers, grand pianos, books, things they couldn't get rid of. It's thought that one of the brothers died buried under a lot of stuff because it set some traps for people who wanted to steal their stuff and the other brother died from starvation because he couldn't get out because he was blind so they were both found by the fire department in March of 1947 dead in their overstuffed apartment. The researchers of the book looked into many types of hoarders and looked at the reasons why they hoard and gather so much stuff. There's a Greek term, oniomania, where people have this impulse to buy. Uh, from the Greek, onius, for sale, and they can't resist a bargain. And they have to buy things. They don't actually really want the things, but it's a bargain, so they have to have it. Many of these things people hoard up in their flats, in their houses, in their storage spaces, still in the packaging. Yeah, it's never been used, they just buy it. Others feel safe, cocooned amongst their possessions. They have a lot of trauma when they try to throw something out. And many who have been forced to clear out their stuff have later committed suicide. It's a very serious problem, this hoarding syndrome. I was interested in the book because I was worried about some of the stuff I get but my hoarding is not quite on the level of the case studies in this book. I have a lot of stuff. Here we have lots of games. We have lots of games. There's Gizzy Clue, Charades for Kids, Guess Who. I collect games. I like playing games. I also collect games because I can use them in my lessons. Some of these games were very useful. Some we play a lot, like Monopoly and Game of Life. Others are not. Here are a lot more games and stuff. And then I've got all my papers. Far oh, too many papers. These I just churn around. And then here's some maps. of stuff. Let's see what's in it. As you can see, these are quite wrecked cars. This is an old Pana. This was made in Tbilisi. A certain amount of stuff and clutter isn't all bad. In this book, A Perfect Mess by Eric Abrahamson and David Freeman, they give many examples of how clutter and mess can aid creativity. Alexander Fleming 
was shown a pristine laboratory and the people told him, imagine what you could discover if you had a pristine laboratory like this. And he said, well, I wouldn't have discovered penicillin. Fleming probably routinely benefited from the messiness of his lab, simply by virtue of the fact that not being neat saved time. He was able to put to better use. But far more important is that if Fleming hadn't been messy, he probably wouldn't have discovered penicillin. Disorder created connections, that is, resonance between the lab and the world around it. If Fleming hadn't left open petri dishes scattered by an open window before going on vacation, the mould that drifted in, probably from an allergy lab downstairs, most likely wouldn't have. What's more, mess preserved and highlighted the unexpected development. And Andy Warhol, the great pop artist, every month he would clear his cluttered desk, put the clearings into a cardboard box and stack the box away. These boxes have become like time capsules of their era. It's been 612 boxes he stacked away. And the book is a fascinating insight into the psychology of hoarding, the psychology of the hoarders. It would seem the best way to work with a hoarder is for family and friends to help the hoarder to get rid of the stuff. With the hoarder there, it may be very slow because it's painful to, for them to get rid of the stuff. But if you take them away, it'll be very traumatic for them to come back and find their stuff gone. If you like this video, you can like and subscribe below and I'll see you on the next video. Goodbye.